we have come to our final session for this evening and that is the CIO panel where we will dive deep into the theme simmering economy sizzling small cap and stretch wall evaluations where to find alpha to orchestrate this captivating discussion i would like to invite ms n mahalakshmi senior consulting editor editorial and content money control please give her a big round of applause ladies and gentlemen and i'd like to also invite our panelists for this discussion mr ashish gupta cio of access asset management company limited mr sandeep tandan the ceo and cio of quant mutual fund mr umesh kumar mehta the cio of samco mutual funds mr selesh rajpan cio equity investments at nippon life india asset management and mr iv subramaniam md and group head equities at quantum advisors Mr Anup Maheshwari co-founder and CIO 361 assets All right over to you Ma Lakshmi for our grand finale Does this work? Okay. Thank you so much, uh, Ruchira. It's obviously absolute delight to be moderating uh, the CIO panel. Obviously, these are the men who have the secret sauce to make us all rich. So, e doubly delighted to have this conversation. Um, so, I'm just uh, thinking where to start because there are so many entry points to the discussion uh, today. Um, first of all we've had a fantastic run post covid um, and i think a big part of the credit has to go to the investor who has showed faith in the mutual fund industry and i'm saying this especially because this is a mutual fund event and uh, the industry has been a fantastic uh, you know counter force uh, the reason why we have seen such resilience in indian stock markets even in the face of a tremendous uncertainty geopolitical tensions higher rates uh, things that we have never seen before and yet you know there is this niggling nervousness that sort of you know grips us has been gripping us for quite some time and a lot of these men will not accept on stage but a lot of them privately also say that you know but for the mutual fund mandate of staying invested more than 90% some of us would of uh, would have probably taken cash calls and would have lost out that just you know what we preach investors the fact that some of the conservative fund managers have also practiced has made us tons of money and i earlier mentioned nervousness because in all previous cycles at least i as a journalist always heard that you know jab paan wala bole stock ke bare mein jab aam aadmi stock ka market ke bare mein baat karne lage so that is the time to sell but in the last two years at least the first year of pandemic i'll ignore but in the last one or two years it's dinner table conversation wherever you go parties outside even when you're walking on the road people are talking about stocks yet the market keeps going up and even today on monday we were frantically at the newsroom trying to figure out what is going to be the effect of gaza our people are are uh, are nervous what's going to happen and the only thought we got and this was the unanimous view from all the people that we spoke to professional fund managers uh, family offices that uh, you know uh, if there is a fall we will wait in the wings and make use of this as a buying opportunity so the question is 3 years of fantastic run super resilience have we become super complacent so may i start with anu uh, thanks mahalakshmi and uh, it's great to be in front of uh, everyone here with all the uh, panelists I think uh, in terms of uh, complacency 
I think it's a matter always of perspective. Uh, we've said this time and again, there's enough evidence to prove that long-term investing in India works uh, because uh, corporates do tend to grow earnings over a period of time. And as long as earnings are growing, I think uh, there will be ports of overvaluation, undervaluation, but in the long run, you end up coming out pretty much okay. I think it's really a bigger call in terms of where India is headed over a period of time. I think a lot of us recognize that over the last three years in particular, there have been a lot of structural changes working in favor of India, a uh, lot of uh, positive tailwinds, things that we had really not thought of four or five years ago. And a lot of this has happened post-COVID, coincidentally. But uh, with everything aligning, I, you know, the, the big question is, what is the time frame, what is the perspective that you have? Do you start worrying about where markets are going to be one month, three months, six months from now? Or do you believe that, you know, we are on a long-term journey of earnings creation and therefore it makes sense to keep participating over a period of time? You know, none of us invest our, all our money on a given day. Yet we behave like, you know, this is pretty much the day where you have to take that whole decision. Uh, so the fact is it's really a long-term game. I think India is a great long-term market, one of the few ones globally that you can find. And therefore, you know, balancing out this short-run sense of complacency with a long-term perspective, I think it's all about perspective. So sure, there will be volatility along the way, uh, but if you stick the course, there's enough evidence and more to show that you do end up, you know, the odds are really high for you to make good money over any five-year cycle uh, of investing in India. So I, you know, I just put the time perspective is what changes everything in terms of this discussion around whether we should be really worried or are we getting complacent, if you have the right time dimension, it's fine. Fair enough. Sandeep, what do you make of sentiment? Because like I said, you know, this humongous retail participation uh, coming through mutual funds and SIPs is definitely a good thing because one, it fosters savings, there is continuity, there is uh, all of that. And there is also this retail that is coming directly, which is, you know, a bit of a frenzy. What do you think? Does it tell you some signals of overall what the sentiment is, what we used to think about as, you know, just anecdotally, if too many people talking about stocks is a bad thing, is a, is a sell signal, how would you interpret that today? So let me start by saying that right from post-COVID, if you have talked about Till today, the geopolitical volatility globally is on the higher side, which has led to some amount of discomfort. Okay, so if if you want to really understand, are we seeing any signs of complacency? Answer is big no. We have seen bouts of some phases. We have seen we have seen complacency. Some phases, some phases we have seen extraordinary hype is getting built. But given the way the global volatility market is, okay, it clearly indicates there is good amount of fear. And what we say in Hindi, jab tak dar hai, tab tak achha hai. Okay? From a behavior perspective, extra smart people, family office, ultra HNI are worried. Back of the mind, they are, they are worried about the market. Every something goes wrong, they can tend to book profit. Now coming question to the retail side. Okay? This space is relatively new for us. But what, as a student of behavior science, if you have to look at this data point, we used to make fun of retail investor in the past. We used to say, na, gaon aata hai, to gaon is good for us, we give exit, they give exit to us. But this time, retail investor is much more mature, okay? They, they were the early, in, if you look at post-COVID, they were the first people who have really participated and their M2M gains are significantly large as compared to any other investor on the street. So we believe that they have made extraordinary money, they have extraordinary cushion, and this time their maturity level is far, far better. We and I always talk about ki every bull market has a leader. This, this bull market is led by retail investor, and I think it is healthy trend. So if, if I have look at purely from sentiments data, they have become so mature that every fall they are buyers, okay? Every rise, they are pruning down their exposure marginally. But every big fall in the market, we have seen huge inflow at least at our end, and that's what the industry data is. So I think retail investor has become much more mature, and I say this, uh, this decade belongs to India, maybe half century belongs to India. So this is the best time for retail investors to optimize the uh, real equity market in India. Subhu, same question to you because we've all learned that this time it's different are the most dangerous words in stock markets. 
No, so it is the most dangerous because it is incomplete. The actual word is, this time it is different, you sucker. Right? So if you, if you complete it, then you will avoid that statement. So, so uh, answering your first question, there is no complacency at all. See, at the end of the day, we are managing money, we are managing people's investments. It's our responsibility to be alert at all points in time. There are m multiple macro risks we have seen all over the years. So my focus at all, all point in time is what are the companies doing? Where, where, are we, where are we invested? And what are those companies doing? And where are the opportunities? And invariably, when you look at aggregates, they will look expensive. But when you drill down, you go and meet companies, there are multiple changes happening at each level. And that gives us confidence in holding on to those shares or buying more or doing a lot of portfolio construction things like, you know, reducing weight or increasing weight. So, so, so yeah, there are challenges, but I don't think we are complacent. And, and there is still a long, long way for us to go in multiple areas in the, in the, in the businesses we have invested in and even in terms of the markets. Sure. I'll just come back to a point that uh, 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 we talked about. Uh, Anoop mentioned this thing about uh, the India growth story and time horizon, which is, uh, which is really the edifice on which the stock market rally and optimism is really built. No questioning about that at all. Uh, from a medium-term perspective, um, uh, Shalish, if you can articulate, you know, what are these segments? Because today we have some kind of uh, conflicting signals in terms of growth. Uh, when you look at private capex, um, for more than 12 months we've been thinking that the cycle will turn. It's taken a little longer than that, and we are yet to see uh, very, very clear signs of that happening. Second thing is, uh, there is some kind of top line uh, uh, growth tapering off in some of the consumer businesses. So when you look at growth from a one, two year perspective, um, where do you see growth? Uh, where, will, where are you expecting surprises? Where are you expecting disappointments? So thank you so much for having me. See, markets always have two phases, right? The one where there are a lot of challenges there, when there are a lot of opportunities which are there. And in every market you get, you know, all those aspects of it. So, uh, like, you know, Subbu and all we're talking about, there is no complacency. In a lot of markets, for example, say, the largest of the largest businesses in India are cheaper than the smallest of smallest businesses in India. This is telling you something. I don't know whether it's a, uh, you know, uh, euphoria on one side of the market or too much pessimism on the other side of the market, but there are many aspects which are working. All this is a function of all the macro things which have been happening and also a function of uh, the near-term growth has been fairly weak. If you look at what has been the last uh, 12, 18 months kind of growth, post the COVID recovery, there has been weakness. Uh, some of it is obviously a very sharp uh, uh, consumption post-COVID and then a normalization, but generally the rural growth is weak, uh, certain pockets are fairly weak. So in the near term, I think growth expectations which people are putting in are way higher, where the market markets are valuing those businesses certainly way higher. And there is a belief that there is a perfect outcome of either elections, a perfect outcome of growth. So that, in my sense, at least for the near term, is pricing in those kinds of things. In terms of sectors you have talked about, right? So let us look at manufacturing and engineering. I think possibly before investment capex has started, right? So the whole journey is still there. So the next four or five years, there is a big opportunity there. The problem is we are paying full prices. So for a company with 12, 1300 crore operating profit, we are paying 95,000 crore market caps. Yeah. So that's the kind of an issue we are today. So maybe we'll have a middling time in the near term. But sectors, business, all the larger part which Anup mentioned, I think it's all in front of us. I think you have to navigate the next 12, 18 months comfortably, choose a better risk reward within play, work on zero leverage as investors, and then stay put. See, the most difficult part is in a bull market, everybody's an investor. The problem is markets go down 20% on some bad news and then how the person behaves. That is true investing. So I think that is yet to be tested on a large stream of new investors who have come about. So I think manufacturing engineering is good. Banks are solidly positioned from a quality of portfolio point of view at the moment. Maybe there's over ownership, but they are, from a valuation, fairly sensible. The ignored companies of the last three years, or who were darlings of the previous three years prior to that, 
they are all to give forgotten uh, blue chips. So there the valuations are fairly sensible. So uh, there are a lot of pockets where there is reasonable value, but there is a lot of euphoria in uh, tiny cap companies or whatever where, you know, you can just think about a company and the price moves up. So that challenge remains. Yeah. I'll come to that in a bit and uh, bang on on the point on uh, growth. In fact, I just pulled out like some very quick numbers uh, from Bloomberg. Uh, nothing hi-fi because we don't have very elaborate research company-wise, uh, etc. But I just pulled out the implied growth from, the, uh, from Bloomberg for uh, Nifty 50 companies and also for mid-cap. For uh, mid-caps, Nearly 33% of uh, mid-cap companies show an implied growth of more than 15%. And another 13, uh, 15 to 20%. And another 33% are in the range of 20 to 25%. So essentially, 70% of the market is assuming growth in excess of 20%. Now, Market-wide, that kind of growth, do you think, Ashish, is, is, is a fair expectation on which we can make money? Uh, no, uh, I agree with you that uh, there is a degree of over-optimism that is there in the numbers. Uh, I think uh, while there may be no complacency, but I think the margin of safety in the market valuations today is low. And uh, actually that margin of safety drops as you go toward lower market capitalization, right? So today, uh, we know uh, uh, the big number, Nifty is trading at about 19 times earnings, but uh, mid and small caps are trading at about a 20% premium to it. Uh, I think it was mentioned before that uh, uh, the larger companies are trading at a cheaper multiple. Right? But uh, that is also reflecting the growth expectations. Uh, all of it is not untrue. So if you see the large cap universe, uh, so primarily in large caps you have banks, you have IT services companies, you have conglomerates uh, 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 in the oil and gas sector, et cetera. Uh, and they are actually not growing very rapidly, right? So they are well positioned, they are market leaders in their segment, but they are not the fastest growing. Uh, as we go in the mid small cap segment, you come into companies uh, which are uh, some are in the industrial space, they are chemical companies, they are uh, uh, auto component company, there are hotels, real estate, uh, hospitals. So some of these companies are actually growing faster than expected to continue growing faster. So if I look at earnings forecast for small caps, that is actually a, almost 30% compared to large cap where the earnings growth forecast is 16%. Right? And this is what is reflecting in the valuations. Um, so, so I think the fact that uh, these stocks are trading at a higher multiple are uh, uh, based on expectations of higher growth. But of course, that comes with a risk, with a low margin of safety, whether this growth can be achieved or not. And I think we go back to Anoop's point that if this growth is delivered over the next few years, then we are okay. If this growth is not delivered, then you will have a correction. What is your take, Sandeep? Because you've, in this market, uh, do you see alpha generating opportunities? And I'm also, I mean, another entry point to this question on alpha is also, if you look at previous market peaks, uh, let's say the 2007 market peak, and I just compared, you know, sector-wise, what were the, you know, P ratios at that time? There was great level of polarity uh, in the valuation of different sectors. You know, they were clearly infra power, et cetera, were very richly valued. They were a large part of this market which was not richly valued. Today, you see every segment is uh, sitting on a higher, uh, higher platform in terms of higher level in terms of valuations. So how do you, I mean, is it a challenge generating alpha? So instead of looking at just pure valuation number, you will not get this answer because on the valuation point of everything looks slightly stretched, okay? But the moment you start combining with other macro data or you look at the liquidity analytics or the risk appetite which we look at very closely, then perspective changes. So let me give you a small example from the behavior perspective. There, despite market has rallied significantly, but there are certain pockets 
which is still trading at the neglected zone. Okay. From a behavior perspective, we try to identify sector or stocks which are trading in the admire category or the neglected territory. Okay. Some of the sector, let's talk about public sector enterprise, which has been an ignored sector. Most of the money managers still like to ignore it. Okay. But look at the return, still trading in a very attractive zone. You talk about mining company, metals and mining, mining in particularly very attractive. Media, again, still trading at the most hated zone. Nobody is willing to touch even. Okay? Pharma was another sector few months back has hit that neglected zone, rather hated zone because people have not made money. So I think there is enough opportunity in the market as long we are looking with open mind and not with a very rigid approach. And the sector rotation is the thesis to generate alpha even in the current scenario. Sure. So I have a question on that, but Subhu, you can weigh in on this as well. So in terms of Alka, you are a value investor. That is your philosophy. Today, when you look at valuations across the board, do you feel confident enough of generating Alpha? Yeah, I do feel confident uh, of generating Alpha. Because as some of the other panelists said, like if you look at, say, banking and finance, uh, it still looks reasonable. It's not very cheap as it was earlier. But it definitely is not on the expensive zone also. If I look at consumer discretionary, uh, I think there are many stocks in the consumer discretionary where we feel the valuations are still very reasonable. Uh, even IT in that sense, uh, if you look at the longer term potential of those businesses, the fact that they generate a lot of cash, uh, I think the large IT companies, despite the possible slowdown, they still look very attractive. If you understand the business models, and how they thrive even in good times and how they thrive even in bad times. So, so we are confident there will always be some challenges, there will be some sectors which look expensive. For instance, infra, as uh, Shaili said. So yes, so we will probably avoid that or keep lower allocations. Similarly, in pharmaceuticals, we may you know, uh, wait before we add. So it boils down to doing homework at company level. But in terms of confidence on alpha generation, it is still very, very high. We feel very confident. Umesh, uh, uh, you are also a momentum investor. You have a formal momentum fund. So uh, today, uh, how does that strategy look vis-a-vis? -vis, uh, you know, how challenging or how confident are you of generating alpha with your strategy? See, today, investors know that equities may paisa banta hai. But now investors are evolved. Today we have 4 crore investors in mutual fund and 8 crore investors in stock market. So they probably know more. So today time is there to give investors differentiated strategy. Paisa banta hai. So raste hai paisa banane ke. Lekin which specific way out. So this is where we brought that momentum fund. And today given the current market structure is we are getting still uh, so off late last 2-3 weeks. The signals were a little less, but we are getting good traction. Momentum is across market wide. There is every sector that stocks are moving, uh, stocks are, mo we are able to identify leaders in each and every stock. 2017, December, January, people are connecting that uh, mid cap, small cap had made a peak and thereafter funds had corrected. And people are connecting the same euphoria with 2013 that small and mid caps have made a peak and that is possible of deeper correction. Our view is that in 2017 December there were only three sectors which had concentrated bets, financials, 28%, uh, your FMCG consumer durables. But today FMC, your financials are less than 20, uh, today financials and all those three sectors are very less. Entire market is go moving higher, your be it construction, construction material, real estate, infrastructure, consumer. Across the board rally is there and we think that uh, obviously there will be pauses, but uh, this bull market uh, should continue. Uh, and we, uh, my momentum uh, is there in... So, so my question is, so what is your fund allocation really like? And I think the more appropriate question for you is, how do you avoid accidents when you have a momentum strategy? Correct. So for avoiding, so currently asset allocation, there are uh, around 50% is small cap and then balance is all about mid and uh, large caps. So this is where the large part of activity is there in small cap. And how do we manage that? Uh, obviously the risk is liquidity because valuations are fair. Uh, 
but the problem is liquidity so we manage liquidity basis the allocation that we made to make to stocks so that in case we want to get out uh, we should be able to get out in a day's time uh, so that is how we, we we manage our risk in terms of exits so every position you are geared to unwind in a day's time yeah every position that we have uh, if need be we can unwind in in a day's time okay i'm just taking a leaf out of uh, what sandeep said uh, anoop uh, he talked about you know uh, ignored uh, segment of the market which is you know a lot of uh, mineral companies uh, and i can see this right here in the implied growth also because the top stock in you know in the implied growth uh, nifty is is um, coal india where you know you're not assuming any growth at all it's a dividend yield stock so so that that list is very clear in terms of where the assumptions of growth are very aggressive where it is low but the question is in those stocks uh, i see that a lot of fund managers and i think uh, sandeep is a bit of an exception there are loath to investing in those that pocket of the market no i think uh you know people have their preferences frankly it's for everyone to pick and choose where they're comfortable in their styles and philosophies but uh, you know if you go back in time there was a time where public sector banks some or public sector companies be, you know between 2002 and 2007 8 uh, did really well there was the whole disinvestment phase and then they went through a big derating starting 2010 and as it just kept derating i think people's interest level also started declining in these businesses now uh it's really a function of uh, again i come back to your sort of uh, how long you've been seeing these businesses whether they fit into your style or not but the fact of the matter is like uh, sandeep correctly mentioned there is a lot of value and markets do have a habit of rewarding companies when they can see earnings growth they can see incremental return on equity rising valuations are reasonable uh, growth is presenting itself and we are seeing that across a lot of that space so uh, it's a you know we have a bit of a never say never type of approach because uh, there are many businesses that will have their own time and place of growth and valuation uh, and you know there are a lot of public sector companies also that are managed really well and have the right economics behind them so we are ha quite happy to look into that space and uh, we are seeing that re-rating phenomena going on there so we've seen that in the past we'll see it again you know these cycles so happen. i mean does this uh, mean that today the way the markets are poised you need to you know is there a need for people to i mean uh, subhu might take objection saying that you're talking about style drift but is there a need for people to be a lot more flexible in terms of what i will not invest in what i will invest in because some sections of the market that are cheap are truly the ones that a lot of people don't touch i guess are, are you are you feeling that you know a lot of companies that i wouldn't invest in today i might have to look at those opportunities because other things are looking expensive no i think the worst thing a fund manager can do is try and change your inherent style time and again i think you have to find pockets that you are aligned with your way of thinking uh people have their own inherent styles i think it's best you know in the long run all these styles pretty much delivers a similar outcome to be honest people are sort of bucketed into growth investors value investors all sorts of investors in the long run all these strategies end up you know doing reasonably well it's just that there are phases where one strategy does much better than the other but again the minute you stretch your time horizon there are enough good businesses on all sides so i think you've got to suit your portfolio to your style and your long duration of thought and what works for you if you look for more value that's great if you look for growth opportunities that's also fine uh, but uh, you can't keep changing yourself time and again i think that probably will be worse for you in the long run sure you'll concur with that uh, shalish see uh the i mean actually i should ask this question on both ends because at the at the other end of the spectrum is also companies like zomato and a whole bunch of new age companies uh, with a lot of investors who are 
probably call themselves value conscious will not look at. But today you are forced to probably look at that because that's a big, probably a segment of the market that is going to dominate sometime in future. See, all kinds of businesses are there, right? I mean, and like Anup mentioned, it's the style of the investor which he should focus on because then he's playing to his strength. In in a typical, see, we have seen different different types of uh, bull markets at different points of time. So you had narrow single sector markets, right, which have done well. So you alluded to the fact that now broadly across the board, the valuations have moved up a bit, right? So uh, when you look at um, the, say, just the new age kind of businesses which you're referring to, I think the time frame is the most critical part of it. So if a business has a right to win and you... Uh, are sure that this will be one of the winners in the next few years, then people are willing to pay a premium. The only question is how much premium you want to pay. Four years back, uh, for consumer companies, people paid obnoxious premium, 70, 80 multiples. Four years later, the best businesses in the world, right, have been flattish. So similarly, everything has a price, right? So for example, gold, if it is priced at, say, 60,000 rupees for 10 grams, you cannot buy it at 80,000, 90,000, 100,000 rupees, right? I mean, there's a value to even gold. So in each of these businesses, there is some reasonable fundamental value, and then the whole speculation piece or the orientation piece which is there. So there are many sectors which are offering opportunities where valuations are sensible, like you alluded to, and there are a lot of them which are uh, today pricing in the best of it, where they cannot have a disappointment which can come and, you know, uh, investors will have to run for it. So I think it's a mixed market, right? And... Uh, uh, I think there is a belief or a certainty that this will come. So when there is certainty, there is risk in equities. That's what I perceive, at least in some pockets of the market. The rest of them, the largest of the large businesses, for example, the large cap space today is possibly the most sensibly priced space in the marketplace today. Sure. There's a couple of questions uh, for everyone, and we can start with uh, Ashish. Uh, one is your top sectoral picks, and... Uh, um, uh, you can go on with that, then we'll take the next round. So I think that's uh, easy for me. It comes uh, close to my heart, the financial sector. I think uh, for, for multiple reasons, I think there are very clear leaders, uh, people with very strong business models who are continuing to gain market share. Uh, secondly, valuations are also uh, very reasonable. In fact, uh, this is one space where multiples are actually as much 30-40% off from peak multiple these companies have traded in the past. So I'm uh, quite comfortable. Uh, structurally, in India, there are new products evolving uh, as well. Uh, and uh, we have also seen that the risk of disruption in this sector is less compared to many other sectors given the regulatory framework. So I think that's a simple answer for me. Sure. Uh, uh, in addition to banks, uh, uh, pharmaceuticals is a sensible place, sensibly priced, and obviously the longevity of the sector is there because whatever is right for India is wrong for India in terms of healthcare. So I think the same opportunity lies there. So, uh, but maybe... Salish, this is a sector we've talked about for so many years and the generic story has really not played out the way one thought, especially in the past 10 years, it's been such a uh, disappointment. What has changed now? I know that, you know, a couple of things, industry, uh, you know, yeah. vendor consolidation problems over, but the pricing pressure continues. What exactly has changed that makes you bullish? Because this argument has been made many times before that it's just 4% of the index. It can be such a significant portion. It deserves to be, but it hasn't worked out. So there are a few things which didn't work out or whatever. So if you look at those specific uh, aspects, it's like there was extensive overpricing in the U.S., because of less competition, there was, you know, people were getting obnoxious prices and profits, and those were given very high P multiples in the market. So that segment has eroded, right? So today the construct is a large part of profits are from simple domestic business, the domestic branded business, which, you know, medicines which we all consume. And there the opportunity is uh, materially long. In fact, that segment has compounded in the last 20 years at least 15%. Right, and I think that same opportunity exists because this is still highly underpenetrated as a space. You know, diagnostics is cheap, everything is there. And uh, like you all know, whatever is young about India in the sense, you know, the uh, below 25 is 50% of population below 28. The reality is we have 30 crore people over the age of 50. Right. Right, and India is a country with all the developed country diseases. 
there's cardiac, but there is uh, diabetes and all that. So the construct is fairly there for a secular long-term opportunity for companies who service uh, the customers and meet their you know, uh, medical requirements. So this is a journey which has just begun, right? And the domestic piece has worked very well even in the last 10, 15, 20 years. Right. It's just that excess profits of the U.S. have been eroded. Correct. Fair enough. Anup. Sure, Mahalakshmi, this is actually it's a tricky question when you talk about sectors because it finally boils down to which companies Stocks, you yeah. own. But at a very, I guess, a broader level, just to give a view, uh, I'd agree with Ashish on financials because it's 30% of the market. It's difficult to imagine you know, the India story happening without financials participating in it. It's also the bedrock for a lot of consumption-driven sectors in terms of lending. Uh, so financials, is, it's a volatile sector, but long run, you know, has created value. Uh, so that would have to be one. And uh, consumer discretionary also, I think, is going through a slightly awkward patch, and that will present opportunities. Typically, you're always, always looking for good businesses going through a rough time, and uh, a lot of consumer discretionary businesses fit that bill right now. Sure. Sandeep? Our biggest holding will be is by far is energy at current level, followed by pharma and materials, okay? And uh, not as a contra call, but data-driven call, hardly any exposure in banking. So less than 5% exposure we have in banking, and of course, largely PSU, and of course, a large exposure in public sector enterprises in general. Explain why. Because, um, uh, uh, and it's a very interesting thought because an overwhelming majority of uh, fund managers are uh, overweight banks. And the index itself has a very large weight, uh, uh, you know, uh, banks have a large weight in the index itself. So, uh, you said you have the smallest weight, right? So, so uh, Malakshmi, apart from the just looking at the valuations, I agree. Valuations in bank has also corrected, so they're reasonably attractive, okay? But we also look at two-third weightages given for us in the risk appetite and liquidity. For the risk appetite for the entire banking sector, particularly private sector banking is shrinking a lot. Liquidity is also declining. And this is the one sector which you look at, uh, I think somebody mentioned about the over-ownership. If you look at ICSA Bank has not delivered any returns, meaningful returns in last one year, grossly underperformed, so is the Kotak and so is the case with now with HDFC Bank. So when you look at price performance, you might get some answer. When we look at mathematically uh, more from a risk appetite and liquidity, we get fairly good answers. That is the, one of the reasons based on our predictive analytic thesis. This is the one sector we should like to avoid. And we have good exposure in the past, but the current level we have pruned down significantly. Also explain energy because that again is a contrarian call. So energy fits the bill perfectly from a, so we have seen a bull run sort of thing in power sector, but if I look at a largely energy as a whole, we, we like it because valuations are very attractive and obviously the biggest stock will be for us will be Reliance Industries. A lot of people have ignored the, that this company, I'm taking a name generally, we don't talk about names, but it's the one sector thing. So all, all the OMC companies and the entire space looks very attractive. The, the way globally people are talking about hydrogen and lot, anything which is related to that could be a big opportunity. And this is again a sector which we think has been neglected a lot. To set up a company like OMC companies or HPBP, well, ultimately they're energy company. Today they're selling uh, oil and gas sector or the petrol and diesel. Maybe tomorrow they'll sell uh, hydrogen also. Who knows how exactly will shape up, but so minor changes. Look at the classic example of NTPC. People ignored it for donkey's years now. Okay? Now suddenly everybody realized, the best of the analysts has suddenly realized and woken up that this is the company has great potential. So is the case with Coal India. Suddenly everybody woken up, woken up and it's a Coal India. So energy by default is the biggest thesis for us. But OMCs, I mean, how do you justify and how do you even look at these stocks? Because if you look at the earnings traje trajectory, it might look very hazy because today there is so much, there is a, a certain lack of clarity in terms of where crude prices will go. There is election coming up next year. So how will, you know, government respond to uh, pricing and all of that? See, again, um, if you look at valuations are very attractive, okay, the earnings are pretty decent, okay, now we can get into an argument mode sort of thinking why it is not, but I don't look at data in isolation. 
our approach is combination. So when multiple data points are skewed on one side, we do take a call. So it's a, a combination approach which we are trying to capture rather than just looking at the purely on valuation analytics because valuation analytics can give you uh, early stages of entry point, doesn't give you exit points. So it's very important to look at multiple data points just rather than looking at pure valuation numbers. Fair enough. Umesh, yeah. you should be the opposite <laughs> of one sector strategy. Yeah, so one sector which is very attractive is defense. Uh, one and a half trillion rupees earlier was outward looking, but now because of government's mandate is now inward looking. And defense as a sector, there are so many companies which are currently available at fair to reasonable valuation. I think that is where uh, going forward, uh, caveat, this government should continue. Uh, I think defense which should take, should create a lot of value. So how do you sort of, uh, you know, insulate yourself from a risk like that? Um, because, uh, in fact, you know, I think uh, I'm not even asking some of these people because I think many of them may say that defense is a pocket that is a, lit a bit stretched. Uh, please correct me if I'm wrong, Shelley, Shanoop, uh, Ashish. So, 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 so the question is, I mean, a, a lot of institutional fund managers... Uh, say that, you know, this is one pocket that is stretched, there are a lot of risks, there is, you know, only one customer out there, there is concentration, um, uh, the other smaller stocks are insanely valued, etc. What is your defense for defense stocks? No, uh, they are not, so valuation is absolutely fair. So I hope I can give examples. Uh, uh, absolutely, with, by all uh, means. With caveat. See, Hindustan Aeronautics today is a large company which has, and I think the biggest driver is government spending. See, today, as I told you, one and a half trillion rupees is up on the table for Indian many, for Indian companies, which earlier, that was not the case. So we have a defense budget of five, five trillion plus, and one and a half to two trillion is meant for acquisition of materials or other equipments. So this, I think, is the biggest uh, pie that has been created and going forward. This is going to increase by 10%. And given the defense, as Sir had also said, that you know certain government pockets are un they people don't touch. But I think defense is a sector that is reviving. There will be a lot of repeated business that these companies will get. And valuation point of view, they are really fairly valued. And if you compare it with other uh, large companies, I think defense as a pocket all companies, with, whether it is Hindustan Aeronautic or Cochin or Garden or uh, for that matter other companies, they all are fairly valued. Government companies and even private sector also, so many companies are getting defense licenses, which earlier was very difficult. So I was there in Pune, and, and, and just give me a, a minute, I will just conclude this. I, I was there in Pune and the guy said that it's since last eight years, so there is this ammunition manufacturing comp organization of government and Pune is a large part of it. Since last nine years, he said, we, have work we are working so hard from morning to night. We have created so much of ammunition. Prior to that, I was so free that the guy who was about to retire, he said that in my previous lifetime, last eight years are the ones I have really worked hard from nine to nine in the evening and I we have made so much of ammunition. So I think government's vision or mission that defense is, a, is an important sector and let's make it an inward looking so that all our Indian companies can get benefit. I think that's the biggest trigger and given the fair valuations. Sure, I think it's only on the fair valuation that there is a lot of debate. There's no question about the narrative. Uh, Sandeep, you want to come in on that? See, I tell you... Uh... I agree what he's talked about is our biggest miss. Even we were very early, and but we sold a bit early because we could not believe what is coming. But I tell you, it's a very evolving industry, still very nascent stages. So it'd be too premature to get too excited about that space, you know. Uh, I agree from long-term perspective, good. But in, from the earnings point of view, I think the market has already factored maybe next three years, five years earning right now. So we are not very excited at this stage for the defense. Yes, it has done extremely well. There is no debate about it. The momentum has played very well out there. But we are skeptical. I think we are largely looking as a value, as a thesis. I think there are other opportunities better than defense at the current levels. Sure. Sabu? Our uh, sector weights in terms of uh, the top uh, would be consumer discretionary, uh, where again we like some of the two-wheeler companies and the four-wheeler companies also in that space. 
And if you look at some of the two-wheeler companies, many of them had a fairly bad few years in between, and then now seems to be coming back, both in terms of product launches and in terms of pricing power. So we are excited. We still think there is a lot of upside left in that. Uh, we are also uh, high weights in the financials, and which is not only banks and non-banking, but also includes insurance and broking uh, as well within that. Uh, and lastly, uh, uh, I would say our weights are quite high even in IT, uh, which we picked up after it had declined quite sharply. We had increased our weights in IT. Uh, we think despite the slowdown, there are a lot of opportunities for the large IT companies, and therefore uh, uh, we have higher weights in them. Sure. So just one last question. So which... Uh, so Sebi Chebin has said that you know the real test for all you know advisors and uh, uh, is to is to uh, is to only recommend products that you would recommend to your mother-in-law. So Ashish, who, which product that you manage uh, from your stable would you recommend to your mother-in-law? So I think the same Sebi has told my compliance department that I, I cannot really make recommendations here. So. Maybe if we have this... Only a fund scheme. I mean, your own scheme that you feel most bullish about for the year. So, uh, again, uh, as uh, I think Anoop mentioned uh, at the start, uh, we really don't want to you know, uh, put things with a short-term perspective, right? So, we have to have a multi-year lens and it's like asking uh, a parent, which child is your favorite, right? So, yeah, so I will... Uh, duck but that every question. year there is always one product that, you know, you know as a fund manager that this has great potential because you look so, at the market uh, segments, I, I you think, look at... Uh, okay, so let me, I think... Uh, uh, and we are talking about yeah. equity products. Yeah, sure. So uh, I think uh, at this point of time, I would say the large cap product, uh, blue chip fund, I think uh, I would recommend that over the other products. Sure. Shalish? See, uh, I don't know with 12-month time frame because very yeah. difficult to predict, right? Market doesn't know a calendar. You know it, unfortunately. But uh, large cap as a category seems to be a sensible space to be in with a meaningful, you know, three, four-year horizon, especially because it's not done well so much in the last three, four years. And you definitely don't want more money in your small cap fund. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Malakshmi, I guess, you know, I can, I guess I'll tell you a little story about my previous job uh, in, in DSP BlackRock. Uh, so we had, uh, uh, in 2005, launched a program called Super SIP, uh, where essentially what we did was we invested for a 16-year period. It was 16 years and 21 years. And uh, what I did was to put equal money in all our funds. So the minute you have long durations, it doesn't really matter. You're better off just spreading across because you're Broadly, whichever fund you're managing, you're managing with a similar investment philosophy. And uh, again, thanks to not just the SEBI rule, but in any which case, I think all of us are also invested across all our funds in any which but case. But yeah, mother-in-law can funds all funds. No, no, mother-in-law, in fact, <laughs> uh, you have to tell her to do exactly <laughs> what you're doing. So I think we follow the same principle for everybody. Uh, so yeah, pretty much, again, you know, if you're investing for 10, 15 years, it really doesn't matter. As I mentioned, all the styles also tend to converge over long periods of time. No, we're talking for about a, next year. One year time Don't frame. invest for one year. I, in fact, anyone coming to the market with a one-year horizon, please remember you're only buying volatility. You're not buying returns. See, right up said, to this, five You years. will drag me into a very different conversation because then I would say, you know, if you always have to have a long time horizon, why do we have so many friend, funds? Right. At all. So you have you know, funds. If the returns for all funds are going to converge, hmm. then the logic for having multiple funds itself will yeah. be taken away. So, no, no, no. It's, what I mean is essentially that you have different styles. Different styles can go through different curves in the long run, really long run. If you, you, know, you can look at it over the past 20 yeah. years, let's say, whatever funds are there. Uh, there will be small differentials, but everybody has by and large done well. It didn't really matter who you picked. You pretty much did well on it. Every fund, you can nitpick about somebody who did a little better than somebody else. But, uh, you know, all I'd say is, you know, again, over long dimensions, it doesn't matter. And literally, you know, we did this uh, just mathematically, if you run risk and reward, you know, if you look at 
we did something called uh, time volatility and return. You know, everywhere we'd go as fund managers, in every audience, pretty much three questions used to always come our way in different forms of fashion. A, is this the right time to invest? B, what returns can I make? And C, what's the risk or the downside? So we just put this chart together, which put all three dimensions on one chart. That became our first slide to just get that question out of the way. And what we did was we looked at time over long periods. We took rolling periods of time, one year, two year, three year, five year, 10 year, rolling periods over the last 30 years. You plot the returns over these periods and you plot the volatility or the risk is measured by volatility of the markets. And what you realize is over you know, rolling periods of time, the returns pretty much are somewhere in a 10 to 15% zone. So the returns don't change too much as you go through periods of time. But the volatility in the short run can be extremely high. So short term volatility is north of 25%. And as time passes, volatility keeps coming down. And in an ideal scenario, you want your returns to be higher than the underlying risk of volatility. And that cut where volatility falls below return happens in a five year time frame. And mathematically, we've shown through earnings growth that five year time frames and above improve your probability of earning or returns drastically. Uh, in a one year, two year, three year five time frame, it's really a matter of luck of when you've entered in. And you're buying the volatility more than you're buying the return. The return comes through over time. So yeah, it doesn't really matter. Sorry, long answer, but that's the perspective. Mother-in-law is disappointed. <laughs> but <laughs> Sandeep, go on. Malakshmi very short. So as a money manager, I like to put my money in quant uh, flexi cap fund because it gives me highest level of flexibility based on the risk on risk of environment. I can switch it from large to mid to small. That's the one product which we really like. And one more I like to add here. Uh, and as an asset classes or as a money manager, I think time has come to look at the multi-asset as a product, okay? I always see Narain talks about it, okay? So we always like that space because that is a phenomenal opportunity which is there which is, and good diversification beyond equities. So f again, from the risk perspective, low volatility product, better returns, okay? So, or rather safe return from a longer term perspective. These two product gives me highest flexibility. So these are two products which I would like to put my personal money. From compliance perspective, we have to put money everywhere. That's a different issue. Sure. My mother-in-law's mother, on, mother -in -law's money, if our FlexiCap fund, I think that has seen volatility in the past year. So now good times. Sure. So when you, uh, when you asked what product for a moment, I thought a product of my portfolio company I was about to suggest a high-powered motorcycle for my mother-in-law. <laughs> but having said that, uh, once I understood the context, uh, I think I will just recommend equities. Uh, and then, uh, depending on her risk appetite, uh, she can allocate between the different styles. Uh, I'm not picking any one style. I'll just say that equities are still worth investing, and she should remain invested. Sure. Thanks. Thank you so much. You've been a very patient audience, and uh, thank you, gentlemen, for all those insights and delightful discussion. Thanks. Thank you, thank you for that very insightful discussion on finding Alpha. May I please request you to stay on stage and may I request the team to uh, share the tokens of appreciation. Well, thank you all. This is a brilliant way to bring us to an end of the second edition of the Money Control Mutual Fund Summit. So many interesting insights and such amazing anecdotes. Thank you. Thank you, thank you everybody. We'd like to thank our partners for the event. Uh, it, this event has been powered by Access Mutual Fund, Strategic Partner, Reliance Industries Limited, Associate Partner, HSBC Mutual Fund, Motilal, Oswal Asset Management, 361 Asset, IBM, 
Baroda BNP Paribas Mutual Fund and Mirai Asset Fund. And we would also like to extend our heartfelt gratitude to our distinguished speakers, our panelists, attendees, and most of all, our audience for making this event a resounding success. It is your enthusiasm, participation, and engagement that has made this truly exciting.